But the paper is called The Politics of Mass Preventive Justice. And, and really, in one part, it starts off from work uh, that Jonathan Simon Malfeely did a long time ago about risk-based justice, in, in which there's been a fair amount of response which has kind of contracted the view that risk-based justice was the way in which justice was being reshaped. And in this paper, among other things, I want to argue, of course, that justice has been risk-shaped at least for the last uh, 30 or 40 years and, and no doubt longer than that because the principal volume of all criminal justice is to do with traffic and the governance of traffic is primarily risk-based. Um, and so we could say, I think it's fair to say, that once we bring our eyes down from where we're used to looking at, which is courts and prisons, and we start looking at the kind of mundane level of justice, which is primarily to do with traffic and its regulation, which is increasingly largely carried out by machines of one kind or another displacing people, then we find that justice looks rather different to the way in which we imagine it. Um, and I suppose it, one archetypal model of this risk-based justice could be seen as the regulation of drink driving, in which we start off with a risk-based offence. I mean, drink driving, once upon a time, you could say, was based on the model of dangerousness, where individuals were judged as to whether this individual was drunk, you know, the white, walking the white line was about a capacity and so on. Whereas really since the 70s at least, it's been about blood alcohol content. And the offence isn't even drunk driving. The offence is having a blood alcohol content above a certain level. So that the risk factor has itself become, in a sense, the offence and has displaced what the offence was governing, which is several steps back now, which is the possibility of an accident. You are now simply governed through risk. There is a, a risk-based process that is, by and large, um, there is an effective strict liability going on in which once you've recorded, once the BAC has been recorded as over the top, there's very little room for all of those traditional ideas of mitigation or aggravation. Uh, if there is aggra aggravation, it's most frequently to do with the fact that your blood alcohol content is aggravatedly high. Um, <laughs> There's a risk-based jurisprudence underlying all of this, which is, of course, the, the objective, scientific and associated reasonings that have justified a certain way of punishment and a certain level of punishment in terms of a discourse of risk and safety. And last but not least, there's a risk-based sanction, which, in the first instance, at least for most people, is licence suspension or licence cancellation, so that that risk-bearing, what Deleuze would call individual, the driver, not the total liberal individual, but that risk-bearing individual, the driver, is incapacitated by having their licence to drive um, removed, erased, or at least suspended. Um, so I, I'm just putting that example up quickly so you can see an example of... of risk-based justice and what I increasingly call mass preventive justice. But I don't actually want to talk about that. I want to talk about something that's more um, mass even than drink driving, and that is speeding. And that speeding, especially since the 60s, has become archetypal, perhaps the archetype of mass preventive justice. Um, because prior to the 60s, there was a big, a very big, big debate, which has not, certainly not gone away, about why speeding should be an offence at all. Because even from the turn of the 20th century, there was a big politics around speeding. People argued that if there was an offence, dangerous driving, then that governed the dangerousness of speeding. But speeding itself was regarded as a tax on pro progress. Why have? Speeding is an offence outside of dangerous driving. That politics was quite lively right the way through the first part of the 20th century. But around about the 60s, along with a lot of other things, including drink driving, um, 
a risk discourse starts to emerge, and partly that is driven, if you'll excuse a pun that keeps coming up in this, um, that was driven by what's been called the democratisation of driving. That especially in the years post-World War II, car ownership and driving have been massified. And that with this mass increase in driving has come a mass increase in accidents. Now, while deaths on the road were a problem from day one of driving, really after, during this post-war period, and especially after the 60s, for a variety of reasons I haven't got time to go into, um, something new starts to emerge. Not this death or that death or the horrifying death of individuals, but rather something which gets called in various uh, jurisdictions the road toll. And the road, road toll appears as a mass thing, that is, as a population uh, measure, something to do with biopolitics, we might, we might say, rather than to do with individuals. So that speeding is transformed. Speeding now becomes not a contentious, well, not just a contentious uh, issue, which should have been better governed or is better governed by dangerousness, but rather speeding become something which is defined in terms of risk. The more kilometres an hour, the more the risk. The, certainly the more kilometres an hour over the speed limit, the greater the risk. And ergo, in some ways, the greater the punishment. And indeed, dangerous driving in most jurisdictions is defined, among other things, is defined by having a speed so many more kilometres an hour. In Australia, I think from memory, more than 40 kilometres an hour over the speed limit is automatically dangerous driving. So that a risk discourse, if you like, a preventive discourse, has eff effectively shaped speeding. But speeding, at the same time, is a mass phenomenon, not because speeding is now understood in that mass way to do with a risk-based model of, of probability, but also because Speeding probably nowadays we could think of as the field of mass disobedience. If in the 19th century mass disobedience is due to do with things like drinking and gambling and so on, now mass disobedience is to do with traffic. Two weeks, I had to tell you, two weeks ago I was in Buenos Aires <laughs> and uh, I can tell you uh, there's a lot of mass disobedience there. Um, so we have huge numbers, and those huge numbers in their terms generate new problems of governance. That once we say, well, we have to govern speeding, it's not optional. Governing speeding is essential to national and individual safety. Then we have a, a key question emerging, which is how can we govern the huge numbers of cases of disobedience that are going to emerge? Really what I want to do very quickly is have a look at the intersection of three technologies, if we want to call them that, which have been mobilised to govern speeding. And then I want to look at um, the resistances that have emerged around these. Um, these three technologies are firstly, risk. Secondly, technology, that is, uh, we might say e-technologies. And thirdly, money. Uh, and money, in many respects, I want to suggest, is the most important of these technologies. Risk I've already partly covered. But one of the critical things for governing mass disobedience in the contemporary environment, funnily enough, has been risk because risk... I hope that wasn't important. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, risk is is interesting because it has allowed a calculable morality to emerge. That, that if you can now think about a risk jurisprudence as being about safety and being about the way in which we can use risk indicators to produce safety and thus a criminal law based on security and safety, that criminal justice process can now, can now easily be quantified. Because, as I say, so many kilometres an hour represents such and such an offence. And the importance of that is that it can be, in its turn, mechanised or, elect or electronified, if that's a word. So that, of course, nowadays, for most of us, 
Speeding involves an electronic surveillance apparatus. It might involve cops with a handheld radar gun. Increasingly, it involves uh, monitors of one kind or another along the road, gantries, for example, in uh, technologies I won't go into at the moment, satellite tracking technologies, um, which can now regulate and assess not only that you are speeding, but in the same moment, what exactly your offence is and what level of offence it is, precisely because risk has allowed this quantification. And that, in, in turn, allows lots of other things, which I'll come on to in a second in more detail, but I could say what happens now is that, in a sense, the entire process of justice, as we will see, can, can occur in a virtual environment. The first part, the policing part, is occurring almost entirely in a virtual environment. Indeed, when I was driving in Buenos Aires, my colleague who was driving said to me, oh dear, I think I've just been fined, which to me became a kind of definitive statement of this new justice. I think I've been fined, because it's a camera. The camera, because the camera can record your offence, it passes that information to a computer. The computer can now not only calibrate the offence, but calibrate the punishment. And that punishment is then printed out by a computer or, in some jurisdictions, emailed. It comes to me and, in turn, I pay the fine electronically. So that everything has occurred, everything has occurred without anybody seeing it. That the process has been, to use the jargon of the field, simulated. That is, reality and the virtual environment are the same thing. Risk is a central part of of that. And risk is important because it's one of the technologies that allows this mass policing to occur. Um, the technologies themselves are, as I said already now, primarily surveillance, but they sur which, which survey codes. Again, they don't really survey individuals. The camera, for example, the camera will take a digital a digital image. In the first instance, at least, a digital image of your registration number, and that code is, trans is what is transmitted. It's that code, that electronic trace, which is the subject of governance from then on, unless I choose to opt into the system. And the system, in many ways, is designed to persuade me not to opt into it. For example, by offering me inducements not to opt in. Well, to start with, when the penalty notice arrives, um, then the penalty notice actually is already assuming you know, there's a reverse onus, that I have committed the offence. I'm going to have to demonstrate that I didn't, or that my wife was actually driving, which is, of course, what many of us do, uh, or that somebody else was driving, which a famous Australian judge did. Unfortunately, he picked someone who was dead, and he then got two years for... Uh, perjury, but uh, never mind. Um, uh, so that, that we have a, a, an electronic technology which can deal with this in part because of the jurisprudence of risk and in part because it is dealing with electronic codes and that we are dealing with traces and we're dealing with a justice that for the most part is not about then individuals but about individuals who preferably never appear you know, we have reverse onus. We have financial inducements not to go to court because frequently penalty notices are discounts on what the total sanction available is. If we do go to court, we run the risk of getting both a fee and a conviction, and so it goes on. The system is designed to keep us out, keep individuals out, leave individuals in. But funnily enough, the... The technology that's most important, I think, in all of this is money. Because money is quite extraordinary and it makes this possible. Money is the only sanction that can be digitised. Well, no, that's not strictly true. Licence cancellation is also digitised. But money is a digitisable sanction. That's how come I can pay it online. But the other fascinating thing about money as a sanction, which also explains how come I can pay online, is that Money sanctions, whether we're looking at criminal law or civil law, don't have to be paid by the wrongdoer. Now, that in itself, of course, tells you something 
that is very interesting about justice, that it's not actually about individuals at all, it's about the distribution of harms and risks, because our principal sanctions, damages in tort and contract, for example, or uh, fines in criminal law or quasi-criminal law, don't have to be paid by the wrongdoer, and if the wrongdoer had to pay them, our justice system would look very different. So that being the case, we could say anyone can pay a fine, and ergo, it becomes possible to deal with it online. If we had to demonstrate that I was paying it, it wouldn't be possible to pay it online. So money is critical in that sense. Money, both in one and the same moment, allows for the anonymity of payment, but also shows how we are shifting away from an individual-based system of justice towards a mass system of justice in which we are concerned with the flow of behaviours. Really what we're focusing on is individuals and their behaviours, not so much individuals. Their motivations, their mindsets and so on are pretty well irrelevant. You know, nobody's much interested in these things. They're interested in reducing risky behaviours. <coughs> so um, I can go on about this for at some, some length, but Richard won't let me. Um, and this in turn could set you up as seeing, and I think I wrote a paper which, which did a little bit of this, as there being a kind of technological determinism, that this is the future, that it's going to go this way. And you can read quite a lot of the literature in this field, even Deleuze himself in his, his essays on control society. It's being a little bit in that direction. After all, here we have a justice system that is based on risk and you know, prevention of harm. What, what possible objection could we have to it? It deals with money, which is pretty low profile. It's a price. It's not like going to prison or being whipped. Um, and it all occurs anonymously online. You know, there's no public shaming and ceremonial. So we could see this. I should say one other interesting characteristic of money sanctions. All of this, and it pays for itself. <laughs> and not only does it pay for itself, it produces revenues. This system can go on forever. Um, but that's not how it's worked out. And I spent some of the last six months trolling the internet looking at what we could call resistance sites. Because in quite a lot of the literature, there is a debate arising about how, in post-civil society, in a society in which individuals have become much more important, in which massification has become much more important, in which things happen online, how can we get a resistant politics emerging? And one answer to that has been precisely the domain of the individual. That is, the e-technologies, the internet in particular, has been vital in providing a venue for a certain kind of politics that is not party-based, it's not identity-based. Gender, for example, class are usually fairly invisible. Um, but actually is a site of coming together of the individuals whose only thing in common is they're really pissed off about the system of sanctioning that works through cameras and money and governs something called speed, which they think they're pretty good judges of. <laughs> um, so I've been looking at that resistant politics and I'll, I'll tell you quickly what I find interesting about that resistant politics. First, that I said to you, well, how could anyone object to this because it's based on risk and safety. It's in all our, you know, who wants to increase traffic accidents? Well, funnily enough, while that would seem to be a resource of this kind of justice, it's also its Achilles heel. Because it is simultaneously, well, it is focused so that the entire idea of this justice focuses on increasing safety. So unlike most other areas of justice, there isn't a fairly nebulous morality which we can always refer to to say, well, you know, it's humanly wrong to do X. If I can demonstrate that cameras, for example, governing speed, don't produce more safety, this whole apparatus comes in for quite a deal of criticism, and that's exactly what's happened. Things like people registering 40 cameras, that's the easy one. A whole lot of people, because, of this, again, the internet, as we know, is a tremendous source for the information 
exchange. A whole lot of people bringing together evidence that shows that cameras, for example, speed cameras, have diverse effects. For example, red light cameras do decrease the number of broadside accidents, but they generally increase the number of nose-to-tail accidents. Speed cameras, <laughs> yeah, right. speed, well, speed cameras uh, have a very, very variable effect. Overall, um, almost everybody agrees that overall they produce a lessening in, in accidents, but particular speed cameras produce an increase in accidents. Um, and there's a big debate on why that is, and the argument takes a form that many of us in the risk field know, that there is a difference between the particular situation and the abstract model of risk. And so there are lots of debates about, in Melbourne, for example, my, my former home city, um, where, they, where they had to close off the speed camera system on the ring road because of the demonstration that cameras um, were misregistering speeds. When they closed off the system, the rate of accidents dropped. Needless to say, you know, the internet was full of this. This has happened, <laughs> this has happened very, very frequently. My point is, and that then translates, has been translated into a party politics and a governmental politics. So that quite a lot of domains, speed cameras, have been withdrawn precisely because they are so vulnerable, because relying entirely on the risk-based jurisprudence, if the risk-based jurisprudence can be shown to have a flaw in it, then the system can be taken away. No one says prison doesn't work. Right, well, everybody says that, but, but people don't remove prisons just because prisons don't correct. But we do remove speed cameras. If it can be demonstrated, they don't increase safety. Um, one other, one other uh, domain is money. One of the key arguments is that money is so invisible that nobody's going to much worry about it. Couldn't be further from the truth. Because one of the first things that comes, comes up and continues to come up, historically and into the present, is that money is revenue. And therefore, governments have a vested interest in installing speed cameras because they produce revenue. And that has been perhaps a major form of critique. And it has led to a particular critique that's been very effective, which is to say speed cameras should only be installed where they reduce, where they can be demonstrated to reduce accidents, because otherwise they are clearly just the means of increasing revenues. A huge online politics built up around this. Again, the, the very technology, money, which would appear to be an advantage for the spread of the system of justice, turns out to be its Achilles heel, because governments are extremely vulnerable to the critique that they're just generating revenues. Well, I won't go on. What I want, so what I want to, to wrap up in saying is that the, to point, first of all, to the way that justice is going, the way that justice has already gone, that it is fundamentally risk-based. It is also something that criminologists don't look at because traffic and money are kind of beneath our dignity. Um, but, but secondly, that it is not going to expand infinitely. All forms of governance produce resistance, and these resistances are beginning to have quite an array of effects across the board. Just how that will work out we don't know. That's not. Thank you. Hmm? Stay there. I'll stay here. Okay. Do you want me to go? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so you can talk about me? I'm our first questioner. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really like your presentation. The, the, uh, I think the points cross several fields. Particularly, I'm interested in resistance. Uh, uh, very brief comment, in, in, in several of my courses I have units on resistance, how students resist surveillance. And one of, several of my students told me when they go through the red light cameras, which are quite common in Arizona, they, they know, they anticipate them, they know where they are, so they cover their face <laughs> as they go through the cameras. So, so they get, uh, two, two other just quick tidbits. In, in Arizona and, and throughout some other states has been developed a whole cottage industry on how to avoid uh, getting the uh, uh, 
a summons if you've been if you violate a red light camera or even speeding and they're delivered by mail in Arizona for them to count and so there's a whole list of things one of the things is you don't answer the door for some <laughs> and there's a whole whole bit there and the final thing is uh, Arizona actually uh, had uh, speed cameras on on several of our freeways but uh, but people protested because they thought it was, sort of, among other things, that it was just a way for government to make money. Mm. Uh, and even though they acknowledge it might reduce taxes, and they, they, they can, the, can the law there. Um, uh, any, any of those you care to comment on? Yeah, all of them. Because um, they give me a chance to say things I didn't have time to say in the paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a huge array of these resistant practices. And some of them, you know, uh, you can get a film like, like kitchen wrap that you can put across your registration plate. It's invisible to the eye, but it completely disrupts digital <laughs> photography. Um, it's illegal, but of course, who's going to find out about it? Well, other people come up, going online on these things is just a hoot, you know, it really is. People are saying, oh, I've got spring-loaded number plates, you know, that when <laughs> my number plates fold up. <laughs> you know, well, now, whether they have or whether these are fantasies, I, I don't know. But I'm, I'm intrigued that your idea that you can somehow resist by, by not answering the door. Uh, because I have to tell you that, at least in my jurisdiction, the presumption is, the presumption, the legal presumption, is that you have received the notice. No, in Arizona, it's not like that. No. Wait. Arizona's a bit bigger. A bit bigger? Are you sure of that? Um, anyway. Um, so... There are ways around this, um, and there are every every resistance generates another technology. So of course, the the newer technologies are what are called EVI, electronic vehicle identification, where you put a chip in the car when it's manufactured, so that it, your vehicle can be tracked at any time at doing anything. Um, well, no, I'll. I'll... Okay. Um, there's your view. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry to keep asking questions since I didn't read the paper or anything. But uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. And, but I have kind of the opposite thought. I've, I've been tracking the effect of Homeland Security on Aboriginal people in North America crossing the border. And it's, but here's what it's led me to. That in this period of, uh, of uh, technology surveillance and so forth, it's also caused a, a highly personalization of it. In the sense that the Homeland Security people I think they feel like they're living under a particular philosophy, and they use that to be uh, highly idiosyncratic. In the case of native people, they, they, they use their own phenotypical observations about who's native or who isn't native. And they're turning back people from BC, where they say, who present their native their, their band cards, saying, you look like an Indian to me. And I've tracked some of this. And, but the other thing, what I'm trying to say more generally is that in this era of uh, massification, it's becoming so personal. I just heard about a guy that was turned away from the border because he had gone through and turned down his American citizenship. So the personal response of these guys at the border is to pick on and actually deny him access to the U.S. ever again. And uh, I, I think many of us have stories like that where uh, people, I mean, so there's a, the other phenomenon of this is the intensely personal uh, portion of it. I don't know how to articulate that better. Yeah. Um, well, to the side, to one side of my paper, one book you might want to read is Toby Kelly's book on how Israeli border guards deal with Palestinians in an era when you can't trust ID papers because they're all forged, um, where you come back to personal clues, bodily clues, and, and so on. Um, yeah, indeed, one of the things, and it's interesting you raise the um, Aboriginal people issue because... That's become a major politics now in, well, in Australia because a great number of those people fined can pay the fines. 90-something percent of fines are paid within a period, you know, a very short period. But on the other hand, something like 70% of unpaid fines are those, those delivered to Aboriginal people. Uh, and that produces a huge politics, which won't go away, and in one sense isn't quite about individuals. Um, and so there is, there is now in place a whole variety of mechanisms being put in, um, in place to deal with this, which 
which become quite complex and, and in a sense, produce another reform of justice. So in my home state of New South Wales, the largest judicial organisation is the State Debt Recovery Office, which Janet will know about. Um, not that you get a lot of fines. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. The State Debt Recovery Office opens up something like uh, 400 new items of business every day, um, most of which are to do with fine enforcement. Um, it's not even part of the Justice Department, it's part of Treasury. Um, but it makes judicial decisions. So it can make decisions, for example, whether you are a fit and proper person to go into community service instead of paying off through fine. It'll decide, it'll determine whether, the, whether to put a lien on your income or whether to send the sheriff in to possess property and so on. Um, but in line with that, there's now been a direct politics that is bearing on the State Re Debt Recovery Office's disposition of sentences in relation to Aboriginal people. Um, now, I won't go into the complexities of that, but it's to say that, that precisely the more you look at these things and the more time goes by, the more complex the politics becomes, a re-individualisation or perhaps you know, another new form of ways of thinking about people and justice um, that, that weren't there a little while ago. Okay. Uh, I've got three questions. I think that's going to be it, probably. Yep. Um, Sam, apology is the last thing. <laughs> um, I wonder if I could ask you to comment on three concepts how they relate to the risk market. The concepts are autonomy, harm, and deserve. Um, my work is in trafficking of weapons, and there are certain parallels with uh, the driving example, and I can stick with the driving example momentarily. Um, isn't there a criticism that by penalising people for driving too fast, you compromise autonomy? What you should do, the argument might go, is punish the people who actually cause harm based on desert, and the general deterrence functions backwards to um, create incentives not to be driving too fast. And that way, you avoid arguments about over-criminalisation, which compromises autonomy. I'm just interested, it's much more of a live argument in my field about weapons than I think in, in speed driving, but it's an interesting argument. Um, yeah, my, my quick answer to that is how, how you do need to attend to what the object of governance is. Um, for example, if we're talking about speed, then there's a lot of issues about, um, you know, people will say, well, I'm a judge. You know, the risk can't really be governed by kilometres an hour because there are certain circumstances out on the freeway. We're going five or six kilometres an hour over the limit does not increase the risk. And, you know, they'll say it's stupid to say that it does compared to five or six kilometres an hour in a city. So you do get those sorts of arguments that people say speeding shouldn't, you know, speeding shouldn't operate as a risk-based factor. But the fascinating counter to that, again, you know, I started the paper briefly with the discussion of alcohol. I have not seen any sustained critique of blood alcohol content. Um, it's fascinating, even though it is in exactly the same way a risk indicator, in exactly the same way as speed is. Speed is subject to that politics. Blood alcohol is not subject to that politics. Now, um, you know, we could speculate as to why that is and we could look at it in more detail and I think we all would have some, some pretty clear clues about that. But So my answer would be, well, there isn't a general answer to that. I think you would have to look at both the, the politics and I guess, you know, the normative uh, arguments always in specific relation rather than a blanket view across the field. Okay, ben. Do you, do you ever see when you look at the politics, for instance, it's, it's slipping from these arguments about safety, right, the, the disproving of the, the supposed benefit, to sort of more larger arguments about principle? Because when I have occasionally dipped into the speed camera arguments, often what you find is they also start marshalling privacy arguments. They start pulling those in as well. In the absence of evidence, right, they, they're, they're, having, they're struggling 
that they will say, but I also have some other, there's something else going on here. I Sorry, think. they being the drivers? They being the drivers yeah. who are opposed to the camera. If they actually try and co-opt in other arguments, have nothing to do with the safety argument looking for a broader principle. And often, it's interesting because the, the discourse is usually very rights adverse on all sorts of other ways, but suddenly privacy becomes very important when driving your car fast. You know, one of the, I thought this when I went into the, um, reading all these thousands of blogs and websites and so on, which the, the humorous side does wear off after a few months. Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's populated by some lunatics as well. <laughs> um, and that is how little the privacy and human rights issues come up. Um, I haven't done a quantitative analysis of this, but I would say probably most of the postings that I've looked at have been about how privacy and human rights issues have failed when they've gone to court. So there have been attempts to say this is an invasion of privacy or it's an invasion of human rights. The arguments are generally either, uh, well, you don't have these rights where you're committing an offence, uh, or and, uh, and that's a, a US uh, court finding or a European court finding which is that if, for example, your face is in public display most of the time, then too bad. Yeah. Um, but those, what is interesting is then that how little explored that issue is. So if you go across and you look at the technology issue, it, it's tremendously sophisticated, varying admittedly from the ridiculous you know, to the technologically sophisticated. But all sorts of technological arguments come in quite, you know, people have, have hacked into police websites and they've found police reports saying, well, rain, wind, uh, dirty windscreens, you know, uh, proximity of uh, aircraft, for example, can all disrupt camera readings. That's all quite sophisticated. The privacy and human rights level is not. Most often you get throwaway comments about Big Brother State, and that's it. So it's not that they're infrequent, they crop up, but the compared, I would still say numerically, they're not in the ballpark. And in level of <coughs> detail, of depth of analysis and engagement and discussion, um, it's passed over. Now I know that in the US, some states that have, have banned speed cameras have mobilized the um, you know, those kinds of human rights privacy issues. Um, but as I say, online, not, not a big deal, surprisingly. Okay, one final, uh, sorry, no, uh, the, yeah. Um, I found your, um, your little story about the, the camera and being fine really fascinating. It made me think of the camera as being a little um, courthouse and, and you feel like while you're driving through, you went through the whole process of being observed, uh, judged, and convicted at the same time. And um, later you were talking about how if you're not, if you were not in prison at the seat, you can um, talk with that. And that it made me think of, of the appealing process, and it's it's all can be wrapped as an electronic court. And I, I thought it was really, really interesting. But then, in a way, it also makes, and then you pay online. So this whole proceeding of committing crime is, is happening on itself. And I was trying to think if there are other crimes that we commit that can process that way. And um, in a way, we are trying to make it clear that this is a serious crime and people can die from speeding. But then we process it in a way that is very unique. So isn't this um, process make it in a way less dangerous because we process it Because it routinizes it, yeah. Um, well, of course, the argument there, well, there are two arguments around that. One is that, of course, the more you go, as I said, the more <coughs> higher your speed over the speed limit, then that becomes quite serious. And when you get dangerous driving, of course, then you do shift from being individual to being an individual and you are hauled in front of the courts. Um, and you may, in fact, face a sentence of imprisonment under certain circumstances. 
So the calibration does partly look after what you're saying because it'll say most speeding offences are not that risky, but they are slightly risky. But the second issue that that raises is, of course, demerit points. Um, because the problem with relying on money is, is you know, Jeremy, what I'm fond of saying, Jeremy Bentham, good old Jeremy, said that a fine is a licence paid in arrears. Um, and so as long as you're willing to pay the fine, you can speed. Um, but of course, if you're driven by a safety discourse, a safety technology, that's a huge problem. And that's why demerit points are invented. Um, and so the demerit points add up to license cancellation. Don't forget, demerit points, of course, are also awarded electronically. Um, and license cancellation is awarded. So at least in my jurisdiction, nobody comes around to take your license away from you. It's just that if you're ever picked up by the police, they just swipe your license and that's it, you're gone. Um, besides, your license, certainly in Australia, your driver's license is virtually the only piece of government photo ID there is. Um, and even a cancelled driver's license is perfectly good because you can't tell it's been cancelled. It's only been electronically cancelled. <laughs> But that's another story. So. <laughs> <laughs>